If you have a Bible with you, turn to the ninth chapter of the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14. Glad to see everybody here with us today. And as you know, when you see the tables, it means we're doing a workshop for marriages. I always ask that you pray for the people involved in those workshops. Lots of really, really good people, sometimes facing some pretty tough times, and could definitely use the prayers. To set up what we're going to be reading in the ninth chapter of Mark, let me tell you some of the things that went on in the eighth chapter of Mark. Jesus had had one of his miracles where there were thousands of people who had gathered to follow him, and they didn't have any food. Now, you understand that Jesus had been working miracles, and you can think, well, maybe people were following him because they saw it as some kind of a magic show. Therefore, they showed up for the concert or for the show, but that's not really the case. The reason we know it's not just like that is because it didn't show up just on occasion. They got to where they followed him everywhere. I mean, they left their homes. They left their jobs. They're following him because he's doing miracles, and I think... Therefore, we can make the assumption that most of those people had come not out of curiosity to see a miracle, but they had come because they needed a miracle. Who knows what the miracle would be with various people? It could be that some sickness be overcome. It could be that some marriage be put back together. I mean, it could be any number of things, but but they're looking for something they don't have, and they don't know how to find it any other way. And because they don't know how to find it any other way, they have heard that this man can do miracles. They have seen him do things like, well, they've heard at least if they haven't seen it that he's raised the dead. They've heard that he's made blind people see. And so as they follow him on this particular occasion, they're out there. They've been following him. He's in an area not full of fast food restaurants. They get hungry, and so taking just a little bit of food, he feeds thousands of them. Shortly thereafter, he's in a boat. He's in the boat because of the fact that so many people were following him that he often just got crowded out. So he'd get in a boat to go someplace else just to get away from the crowds. On the boat, they have only one loaf of bread. Somebody who had been traveling with him, one of the apostles there, had not prepared well. And so they have one loaf of bread between them. So Jesus starts teaching about something called leaven. Now understand that there's a lot of symbolism in the Bible, and leaven is often the symbol for evil. So he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. What he's saying is, you know, if you know anything about leaven, and I know very little, I'm not a cook. If you put just a little leaven, you can put it in there, and over time it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and what it's doing inside that bread. So a little leaven, it would say leaven's the whole lump. He's saying what the Pharisees are doing may just be that little, but the seeds they're planting, the things they're putting in there can affect a whole lot of things. Well, he's teaching a very major truth about life. That something that may seem very small at the outset can have a really big result later. Because they only have one loaf of bread, they think he's actually talking about bread, and they start arguing among themselves about the bread, and he says, oh, my. are you guys ever going to get it? You've seen me take just a little bit of food and feed 5,000 people. You've seen me take a little bit of food and feed 4,000 people, and you just think I'm really talking about bread? Then he does something. By the way, I think sometimes the way Jesus did things, he did just to mess up the way people think. I really believe that. Because if you would think, okay, if God's going to do a miracle, how long does it take him to do it? I mean, if God wants to do a miracle, can he do it instantaneously? Well, the answer is obviously he can. But here in the eighth chapter, he does something really strange. There's this blind guy, and he touches the guy's eyes to heal him. And then he says, can you see? And the guy said, I can see men walking around like trees, meaning I can see a little bit, but it's still very vague. And so Jesus has to touch his eyes again to give him the ability to see. And, and theologians get into great debate about why. Why couldn't it just happen the first time? Why did he do that? I obviously don't know. I'm not God, but my opinion is he just liked to mess with people. So that when you start getting your theology all together and think it has to be this and then, then that and then, then that, he'll do something that just messes everybody's theology up, letting them know it's not based on your logic or your rules. It's, it's based on me. Well, you get into the first part of chapter 9 then, and what he does is he goes to what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. He takes Peter and James and John with him, and when Moses and Elijah show up, they have this great conversation. By the way, when, when the apostles, they went to sleep, when they woke up, they instantly knew who Moses and Elijah were. I can guarantee you that they had not seen their photos. These men have been dead for centuries. There are no representations of them around, so how did they know who they were? Another great theological question. I think the answer is simple. 
I think they had those little name tags. Hello, my name is Moses. I think that's what happened. And on that occasion, then you, Jesus is, God's making a point through Jesus about what's about to happen. Interestingly, those two men came to talk to him about what he was about to do. He was about to die. You say, why did he have to send people from the dead, from from heaven, if you will. Why did he send those people to talk to him about his death? Because he'd been trying to talk to his disciples, particularly his three best friends, Peter and James and John. And rather than their being understanding and comforting, they were like, oh, you can't do that. Peter literally said it to him, you can't. And Jesus got mad and said, get behind me. You're working for the devil. I'm paraphrasing it. So then he comes back from the mountain. And that's where we start our text. Verse 14, Mark chapter 9. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. The next verse says, as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I have brought my son who, has been, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything to help us, take pity on us and help us. Now let's go back to verse 14. Oh, there's more to read, but I want to go back and make sure we understand what we've read so far. So it comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, at least in the chronology given by Mark. And when he and James and Peter and John, they all come down, they see this big argument. And you have to wonder, what in the world are they arguing about? Well, we find that out in the next few verses. There's this father who has brought his son, who is relatively young, and he is possessed by spirit. If you go on the internet and start looking for various teachings and sermons and commentaries about this passage, you'll find that there are a great many people who will say, well, obviously it was not an evil spirit. It was not a demon. The boy just had epilepsy, but back then that's what they thought it was. And so they thought he had an evil spirit because he had epilepsy. When I was in college, way back many years ago at Alabama Christian College, which is now Falkland University, I remember that one of my jobs, by the way, anybody work while you were going to college so you could help pay your tuition? If you worked on campus back when I was a freshman, you made $1.50 an hour. No, no, I don't think that was bad. That was just about minimum wage back then. And I remember one of my jobs was picking up paper on campus, and there was a, a young man from Haiti, well, not particularly young. He was about 30, so he was older than us, who had come to college to learn how to be a minister, how to be a preacher, and he'd come from Haiti. And he and I were walking, and, and we were picking up the garbage because that's what we were paid to do, fifty to pick up the trash. And all of a sudden, he let a shriek and took off running. And he was obviously very scared. I don't know what he had seen, but I'm not waiting to find out. I start running next to him. <laughs> I catch up. What are we running from? <laughs> he says, the demon. Let's go faster. <laughs> we're, we're headed out. And then and I, we had a safe distance. I said, whoa, what demon? He said, look. We now were a safe distance, at least where he could stop. And then we turned and looked. It was a guy who went to school with us who was, oh, he was disfigured from this terrible disease. He, he walked like this, and he could barely talk. He was brilliant, by the way. He could type. Not on the computers, because computers lived in big rooms back in those days. But he could type on an electric typewriter. And, and he was brilliant. The boy was absolutely brilliant in this body that just barely worked. And I said, Frank? He said, it's a demon. It's Frank. He said, oh, I mean the demon in Frank. And based on where they came from, what was his religion in Haiti, or at least what he had been exposed to in Haiti, they believed that there was some kind of deformity, then it must be demonic. And I looked at it and go... Obviously, we know better than that. That's not demonic. That's just, that's just a religious, that's not religious. That's just a superstition that comes from his country. 
Now, there's some people then who read this text and read it the same way. Well, that boy was obviously an epileptic. There really was no evil spirit. The difficulty is that it winds up being a spirit that we're going to read about in a minute or two. We know that there really is a spirit there. Now, I don't know how you read the Bible, but when I read it, I say, I'll just take it for what it says. If it says it's a spirit, it's a spirit. It's an evil spirit that's coming to this boy. Not long ago, I saw a debate on the Internet. I just happened into it because I went to check my Facebook page that I share with 5,000 of my closest friends. And, and as I was reading through there, I saw a debate, and I clicked over just for a minute. They didn't have much time, and they were debating whether or not an evil spirit could affect a child. And they were saying, no, an evil spirit couldn't affect a child because a child's innocent, and you can only get an evil spirit if you do blank, 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 and blank. It is amazing to me that we can work out our theology to such great detail that we know exactly what can and exactly what can't happen. But in this text, that word for boy... When it says, from since he was a child, that Greek word sometimes referred to kids as young as six. I would think a six-year-old's pretty innocent. What are you? So, yes, evil spirits can affect children, at least according to this text. But they're arguing. You might get thinking, what are they arguing about? Well, maybe they're arguing about what they could do or what they couldn't do, what they should do or what they shouldn't do, or if they could do it or should do it, how they should do it. Because if they do it the wrong way, then obviously, even if it worked, it wasn't right. You said, what do you mean? It means they were at church. <laughs> Apparently, Terry enjoyed that one. <laughs> because that's how religious people do it, don't you think? We've got it all so figured out that we know not only what God will do and what God won't do, but exactly how God will do it. And if it's not done that way, then it couldn't be God. Is that ridiculous or what? You said, that's when I keep going back to chapter 8 and go, why didn't you just heal the guy right off the bat? Why do you have to touch his eyes twice? So you guys wouldn't think you've got it all figured out. That God has to do it this way, and God never does it that way. And I'm doing it a totally different way that doesn't make any sense based on your theology. I, that's why I believe that sometimes Jesus did that. They say, quit thinking is up to you. It's not. You have to trust me as I am. Now, let's go down a verse or two here. Uh, let's go to the next verse, gentlemen. Okay. The reason they were overwhelmed is because he was the guy with the answers, obviously. Verse 16, let's look at that for a second. Uh, verse 17, I'm looking for my verse here. Okay. Verse 18, 19. Ah. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Do you think he ever got frustrated with people? I mean, read that verse and answer that question. Do you think ever, do you think that maybe he still does sometimes? That Jesus at the right hand of the throne of God looks at God and goes, what were we thinking? I mean, look what we've done for them and, and look what we've shown them and look what they're still fighting about. About what you could do, what you couldn't do, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And if you could or should, then how should you do it? Or it's not, you think sometimes their frustration must be boiling over in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so in that next verse, verse 20, guys, so they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, not the epilepsy, the spirit, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. By the way, if you're this boy's daddy, what are you feeling? doesn't mention his mom. She probably was there if she was alive. I'm sure she was, but... It's a, it's a culture where mostly the men talk to the men. So if you're the boy's dad, or you're his mom, what are you feeling? Here's your son that's got this evil spirit that robs him of the ability to talk. He can't speak. And then he goes into these convulsions, and convulsions are bad enough. They would terrify any parent. Some of you had children who had convulsions. It's terrifying to see your child go into a convulsion. But he said sometimes it throws him into the water and tries to drown him. Sometimes it throws him into the fire and tries to burn him. So not only do you have a boy that suffers convulsions, you've got a boy with scars from the burns. You've got a boy that you pulled out of the water and tried to breathe life back into and now here he is. You brought him to the people that you have heard can heal him. They try. They can't. 
And rather than the other religious people going, okay, that didn't work. Let's get together and figure out what will. I mean, obviously it didn't work, but we're so concerned with this little boy and, and, and the pain that he's going through and the love that his parents have that, that it didn't work, but let's together try to figure out how it will work. And instead they get into a debate. It's not even classy enough to call it a debate. They argue. How do you think mom and dad have got to feel? <laughs> There's my boy. And all you can do is argue your theology? Who's going to help my boy? If you think Jesus was frustrated, how do you think mom and dad must have felt? And so right here in front of Jesus, the spirit, the spirit knows this is his last shot. He knows who Jesus is. Throughout the New Testament, you find that these demons knew who Jesus was. He has his last shot. He goes into that boy full-fledged. He's hurting as much as he can. Look at the next verse, verse 21. Rather than just healing him, I mean, you would think the compassion of Jesus, he would automatically heal him. But he doesn't. He turns to daddy. How long has he been like this? From childhood. Look at the next verse. Often thrown him into the fire and water to kill him. But if you, this is the key phrase here. But if you can do anything. If you can do anything. Everybody else has tried, has failed. I'm sure they're taking rid of the doctors that hasn't worked. They may have taken him to various rabbis. That hasn't worked. They may have found an exorcist or two. That hasn't worked. They've now come to the apostles of Jesus, and that hasn't worked. So when he says this next thing, you can see it. But if you can do anything, we've tried everything else. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. By the way, there is no punctuation in the original language. In, in the Koine Greek in which that was originally written, there are no commas, there are no colons, there are no periods, no question marks, no exclamation marks. Therefore, whatever punctuation you put there has to be the translator trying to understand the context. Are you with me? So if you read various translations of this, you see the various punctuation right there. I read one translation where it had an exclamation mark. In other words, they had Jesus going, If you can... On this particular one, it looks like that Jesus is being compassionate. If you can. And, and some of the others, they actually take that out altogether because they say, well, no, no, it's not like two different sentences. What he was saying is, if you can believe. In other words, he wasn't talking about, it's not talking about what Jesus could do, talking about the guy. If, if you can believe, everything is possible. So some translations see it that way. You say, wow, how do we know which one it is? At different points in my life, it has meant different things to me. I have been in situations where we, we've all doubted the power of God, where I wanted to do it the way the other translation did. I wanted to put the exclamation mark. If you can, just out of my frustration. There have also been times when out of sheer doubt. Yeah, sometimes I doubt. I don't know about you. Sometimes out of sheer doubt, I go, if you can, Meaning I'm wondering if he really can. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I have many times. Sometimes I read it with compassion, where gently and sweetly he says, if you can. Maybe it's good that it doesn't have punctuation in the Greek, because maybe, maybe that way it kind of changes based on where we are at the time. But notice the next part. And make sure you see it for what he really said. Everything is possible for him who believes. Now, there are many passages in the New Testament where Jesus does tie faith to action. There is no doubt about that. You know, if you believe, you'll receive whatever you ask for in prayer. If you have faith, even as a mustard seed... <laughs> This will happen. You, you can say to that mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. He, he obviously tells us that faith is a key here. But notice he did not say everything is promised for him who believes. He says everything is possible for him who believes. He said, what's the difference? 
Sometimes I run across somebody somewhere who really believes that if it didn't happen, it's not God's fault. It's not even God's choice. It's all because of the fact that I wasn't good enough or I wasn't pure enough or my faith wasn't strong enough. And therefore, God didn't do it because God looked at me and said, sorry, pal, you didn't make the cut. If you could have been a little bit better, if you could have been a little bit purer, if you could have been a little bit more faith, I'd have done it for you, but you didn't have it. So too bad, you're out. I don't think that they, well, maybe they do, I don't know. But I don't think they intentionally try to preach it that way. But the way they do makes it wind up with that same result. So if something doesn't happen, it's my fault. I didn't have enough faith. God have mercy on me because I limited you. You must understand, at least I, this is my belief, you can accept or reject or modify. God didn't need the faith of a single human being to speak the whole universe into existence. None of us were around. He didn't go, you guys got enough faith going. That'll give me the power to do what I need to do. I can't have the power without your faith. Sometimes I think it's like, we think of theology like Ghostbusters 2. Anybody remember? Not the first Ghostbusters, the good one. The second Ghostbusters, where the river of evil was running under the city of New York. That, by the way, was real. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But if they could get enough goodwill... Remember the movie, if you saw it, if they got enough goodwill, they could do it with a bad guy. And so we can't have power without your goodwill. I think sometimes picture God that way. Boy, if we can get enough faith going, then God can act. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. But he's telling us we should believe. Well, I'm convinced that's right. I've shared my philosophy on that before. Again, you can accept or reject. I think primarily that's because of the fact it's for our benefit, not his. Well, I'm totally convinced it's for our benefit and not his. You see, as, as God can speak universes into existence without winning one of us, God can heal whomever he chooses to heal. God can not heal whomever he chooses not to heal. God can do that. But what I have seen in my lifetime, and forgive me that I've said this before, being a little redundant here, but what I've seen in my lifetime is that people who have no faith, when God does some great miraculous things, still don't have any faith. It's like, he was lucky. Or what a coincidence. And so the illustration I've used over the years, you've seen that little wire that goes to a 9-volt battery. Anybody seen that little square 9-volt battery? Okay, that little wire. And I say, how much electricity can you put through there? I mean, if you somehow picked a plug on one end of that and a lamp on the other and you used that little wire to try to get the electricity from there, 110 volts up to there, I think you might burn that little wire up. What do you think? Faith, in my understanding, is the wire where God says... I, I want you to just keep growing and growing in it. But when your faith gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what you must understand is that faith is not a magic talisman. It is not a lucky rabbit's foot like they had when I was a kid. You can't do that now. It's, it's inhumane. But it's not that. Faith is when you believe, when you truly believe that whatever happens next, I'm in. And it may be what you wish to happen. It may not be what you wish to happen. But when you have that kind of faith, you will see my miracles. But for many people who have little to no faith, even my miracles won't develop faith because they'll charge it to something else. Oh, if I did miracles every day, just like they want them to, they may wind up having faith, but it's not the kind of faith I want them to have because it's not a faith that must trust me. It's the faith that expects me to do whatever they want me to do. And that's not the faith I want them to have. I want them to have the faith to trust me. So everything is possible for him who believes. So can God cast out demons? Without a doubt. Can God heal cancer? Without a doubt. I realize that some of the people who are in our fellowship will say, well, no, those kinds of miracles ended at the end of the first century. <laughs> That's not the faith I have. Everything's possible for him who believes. Why? <laughs> because of the fact that we accept the possibility. I have seen situations where miraculously people were healed of this and miraculously were healed of that. And, and I look at that and go, there's the hand of God. Thank you, God. We're not thinking our lucky stars. They don't count. We're not thinking our rabbit's foot. 
we're not thinking anything, even our luck. We're looking and saying, this is the power of God. And so he looks at this guy and says, if you can. If that is a question, it's rhetorical. You know I can. But what you've got to accept is the possibility. And if you accept that, now you're operating with real faith. You see, you can't make a formula. That's what they were arguing about earlier. If they had different formulas, you can't make a formula that if I have this much faith and do this much praying, then God has to do that. I will not fit your formulas. I will not fit your theology. But if you truly have faith, then you'll accept that sometimes it's going to be painful because God could have healed that little boy when he was six if he wanted to. Why did he let him suffer? I don't know. I truly don't. I don't know why God does what he does, and sometimes I get pretty ticked. What about you? There have been occasions when I've told him, I do not appreciate you doing what you're doing. He has never bothered to reply. You say, then you've lacked faith. <laughs> have you ever been like this, where there are days when you think, my faith is full of doubt? Or days like this, my doubt might have a little faith. Anybody ever felt those at all? Look at the next verse. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me. Help me overcome my unbelief. And that's one of my major prayers. God, at times, I've tried to think that you're not there. And then I look around, I think about all the things that go on. I've looked at the science as best I can understand it, not being a scientist. I've, I've looked at the world as best I can understand it, not being a geologist. I've looked at all these things, and I come to the conclusion there has to be a divine intelligence behind all this, so I know that you're there. I realize that sometimes we who are Christians represent you in such a way that the God we represent shouldn't exist. Do you understand what I meant by what I just said? The way we represent God, there should not be a God like that. But I know that you are there, and I do believe that Jesus Christ truly is your son. I truly do. But there are times when I read passages I don't understand. There are times when I read passages that at least to me look like they might be in contradiction to each other. There are times when I look at life and I see you work these amazing miracles and I go, thank you, thank you, thank you. And there are times I look at life and go, why didn't you work in an amazing miracle? So, Lord, I believe. Help me. Help me overcome my unbelief. Well, the story ends well. Let's just read the end of it very quickly. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. When this boy got a healing, he got a whole healing. You understand? <laughs> he says to that demon, you ain't coming back. Well, he would have if he'd been from Alabama. And then he said, when Jesus saw... Oh, I'm sorry, the next verse. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. By the way, things are not always what they look like. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. He's not just alive. He's a normal little boy. Now they're going to have trouble shutting him up. You think? Now he's going to be a teenager, and the parents are going to be going, where's that mute, mute spirit when you need him? Anybody have a teenager understand that? No offense to the teenagers. <laughs> you'll feel that way about your children someday, and you'll go, that old fat man was right. God can do the miracles. He does them every day. But true faith says everything is possible for him who believes. I'll trust God to make the choices. I will cry and I will hurt. And sometimes I will just have to say, 
I believe. Help me. It's going to be a little difficult to do this this morning so we're going to, because of our structure. So we're going to end this way. I'd ask our shepherds and their spouses, if you will, you guys just kind of get stand around the back of the room somewhere, if you don't mind. Spouses, if your spouses are here, because sometimes people want a lady to be involved in this. Uh, John, if you don't mind joining them. I know Carolyn's not here. She's recovering from her surgery. Maybe you just want to go talk to one of these folks and say, would you pray with me? I believe. Help me. There they are. If you want some people to pray for you, just find the guy standing up. By the way, if you're not a shepherd, but you are mature in the Lord and you want to help pray for people, the two of you go stand up too. How about that? And people can come to you. Why don't we stand and sing this song?